All right, everybody, I think it's probably time to get started. Uh, I'm going to be talking about Rust for JavaScripters. Raise your hand if you write JavaScript frequently. Raise your hand if you write Rust frequently. All right, and raise your hand if you have ever written any Rust whatsoever. Oh, perfect. All right, we have a good mix then. All right, so uh, I'm going to be talking uh, pretty high level. Uh, I'll go over some examples and whatnot. Uh, this is kind of a lot about the why of Rust and WebAssembly and JavaScript. Uh, if you are interested at the end about how to do it and how it works under the hood, I really recommend building a time machine, going back to about 10.30 this morning and watching Steve's talk, uh, where he went over how it all works. Um, but I'm, I'm going to try to cover a little bit about um, the memory model, interop, that kind of thing. So real quick, uh, my background. Um, so I'm Sean Grove. I'm coming out of San Francisco. Uh, I work at a company called OneGraph. I'm not going to talk about that today, though. Uh, in a previous life, I worked on a project. I've only shipped one production Rust project. Uh, but it was in the context of an embedded cross-compiled uh, IoT device. And we needed to be able to continually ship updates to the edge to these things. It was a project that was previously written in OCaml. And we really, really cared about performance. We could not afford to lose these devices at the edge. And so Rust was a really nice fit for being able to uh, deploy to these devices and guarantee correctness so that we didn't uh, have crashes that uh, would cause us to lose these devices at the edge. Uh, before that, <coughs> I wrote a lot of Clojure and ClojureScript. Uh, contributed quite a bit to the ClojureScript compiler. Uh, these days, I write primarily in uh, ReasonML and a little bit of Rust, however. Cool. So for those of you who have not written any Rust, here is my pitch to you. Rust is like banging your head against a wall. So part of this talk is about setting expectations. I think that there is a lot of hype around Rust, uh, the developer experience, WebAssembly, that kind of thing. So I want to make sure that we're at the same, uh, like whenever you enter it, you're not going to be too disappointed. So one of the caveats going into this is you should always expect that the Rust code is going to be longer and more verbose than the JavaScript equivalent. This isn't strictly true, but it's true enough that if you go into it with this ex expectation, you won't be disappointed. So whenever you see kind of longer bits of code, just take a deep breath. It's OK. It's there for a reason. And it will help you understand a bit more. So with that in mind, so Rust is a systems level programming language. Um, I don't know if that's a great term, but uh, for better or for worse, this is how they describe themselves. Uh, it's, very, it's focused very much on performance and correctness. Uh, I would say for JavaScripters, though, the aspects that will be relevant are that Rust gives you very, very low-level control over things like memory layout. And uh, this, in turn, translates into very nice performance uh, benefits. However, traditionally, whenever you're working at the, with these low-level uh, abstractions, um, it's very difficult to get a program correct. Right? So seg faults in C um, are a thing that JavaScript people don't typically have to worry about. Um, leaking memory is a thing that can happen in JavaScript, but it's not the end of the world. Right? The garbage collectors are really amazing in today's browsers. So whenever we're working with these lower level abstractions, we want to have a language that actually helps us as much as possible. Um, pattern matching, type inference, a few other things. So the low-level abstractions come from we want to have predictable performance. One of the, like, while a garbage collector is amazing, right? it's kind of a, a, a modern wonder, I would argue, the problem is that it can be very difficult to predict when a garbage collection is going to run. Right? This is typically known as jank. Whenever you're scrolling through a page and you see frames are dropped, like you're incurring these hits either from the garbage collector or from some JavaScript that's running. And it's hard to predict whether or not you're going to be able to maintain a high fidelity experience in JavaScript. Uh, however, you also, like, while you are working with those low level primitives, it can be very, very verbose, very unpleasant. So, really, we do want to still have those abstractions that we've come to love in languages like JavaScript. So, Rust's ambition here is to give you the ability to layer on those abstractions without incurring the additional cost that tr you traditionally have. <clears throat> and I would say that you know, they go over guaranteed memory safety. And this is just because getting, like, in the face of mutation 
Um, it's very, very difficult to have data integrity guaranteed, in particular when we introduce things like concurrency. Uh, JavaScript doesn't have a ton of concurrency, but it can still, and so we have a whole class of foot guns that are removed from the language. But whenever we want to be able to reach for that additional performance, we are introducing potentially huge amounts of suffering for us as developers. And so Rust inherently in the language works very, very hard to make sure that we can approach this level of concurrency while still maintaining uh, tons of data integrity. And it has type inference, which is really, really nice. Uh, but I would argue, like, ask, what, is, what are types for? And traditionally, I think for C, if you've ever programmed C, types are mainly there for performance. Right? They are describing to the compiler how you want the data to be laid out in memory. The compiler, you know, these days, C compilers do a lot more. But it's not going to do a ton to help you if you get things too wrong. Well, on the other hand, if you've worked in something like type or flow, the type information is not used at all for optimizing uh, the output. Right? It's only used for correctness, just to make sure that you aren't making mistakes. And with Rust, we kind of want both of these things. Right? We want to make sure that we're not making mistakes either at a low level or a high level. And we still want to be able to actually control how our data structures are laid out so that we can maximize the performance wherever we find it's necessary. But there's another language that also has types for performance and for correctness, and that's Java. Uh, raise your hand if you've written Java before. OK, pretty much everyone. And I, I don't want to pick too much on Java. I mean, I think as an improvement over C, for example, it is fundamentally amazing. However, as a language, it does require a lot of repetition here. Right? So I have a number uh, that is 29, and I have to tell it it's an integer. I have to repeat myself quite a few times here. So Boolean is false, and so on and so forth. Uh, and that's where type inference comes in. So a lot of people's experience with types is typically in something like Java, where the, the computer does so little work for you. Right? It requires you to tell it over and over again what the types are. So this is an example of uh, Rust. And in this case, uh, I can create an element. And this u8 is a literal for an unsigned 8-bit uh, integer. And this is, so I'm actually telling it, this is a type annotation. This is a literal. However, I can also create a vector. And a vector is like an array, uh, except we can resize it. Um, but you'll notice that I didn't tell it what this is a vector of, right? In Java, I would be required, or in Flow, or in TypeScript, I would be required to say, this is an array of this type. However, in Rust, uh, we have one requirement, which is you have to have homogeneous arrays. So you can't have an array of an integer and a string and an object. If you have one integer, everything else has to be an integer. So right now, Rust can look at the um, the creation of this uh, variable, and know that it is a vector of some sort, but it's not sure what kind yet. But as soon as we use it, right, as a human, you walk through this, and you'd say, all right, well, you push that element onto the vector. This must be a vector of unsigned 8-bit integers. Right? Why do we have to repeat that for the compiler? The compiler can also follow those steps and actually infer the type for us. And so Rust gets away with, a, I would say, a minimal amount of type annotations, which is really nice. It lets you focus on the logic of the program rather than repeating yourself about uh, what the implementations actually are. And I think this makes both the compiler happy and the programmer happy. And again, this comes from as much as possible, where the computer is better than humans, the computer should be doing work, not us. Like, let's, like computers are great at this. Let's make them do the work. We shouldn't feel shy about that. And then finally, um, Rust really focuses on a minimal runtime. Uh, Rust has gone through a large evolution since its beginning. Uh, it used to have a lot of additional features and bells. And they've actually done some painful extractions of those over the years to actually make it so that it is as close to zero cost abstraction, that the delivery payload is as small as possible. And to kind of compare this to uh, some other languages that haven't done this, <coughs> Go, for example, if it actually has reasonably good WebAssembly support at this point. However, 
Whenever you generate a WebAssembly binary from Go, the output is fairly large because there is an inherent runtime in Go. And so it's, not, it's normal to see, you know, un not gzipped, just uh, plain, you know, a two megabyte output, and if you include some libraries, it'll go up to maybe 10 megabytes. And to be fair, uh, Go is making a lot of progress here. Uh, there is a subset of Go called TinyGo, and if you use that, it's not uncommon to see, for example, 10 kilobytes of output. However, it's a lot of recovering that set of small delivery uh, payload, whereas Rust has kind of had that as an inherent uh, attribute from day one. And pattern matching. Raise your hand if you have never seen pattern matching or never used it in production. Everyone has used pattern matching. Oh, OK, amazing. All right, so uh, I'll just go over this quickly then. So uh, we have an array of strings, or a list of strings, and we're going to iterate over it. We're going to destructure here, get a number out, and match is just like switch in JavaScript. So I'm going to switch based off of this number. And based off of the number, I'm going to print a different um, string out. But you'll notice that it's possible that someone may come and actually add an additional string to that list. You know, maybe that list is somewhere else in the code base. They're not co-located. And now what's going to happen at runtime whenever I execute this bit of code? Right? It'll get to three. There's no case there. This will crash. So this is not just pattern matching. This is exhaustive pattern matching. Where Rust is like this amazing like, pair programming buddy that will tell you, hey, I noticed that you missed this case. This is, if this happens in runtime, I will crash. And it will forbid you from actually uh, compiling this application. And if you'll notice, the error messages are heavily inspired from um, Elm's developer experience. And this is unusual in a systems level programming language. And this is actually ends up being very nice if you're coming to it from something like JavaScript where you want to like, gradually learn these concepts and figure out why is this potentially dangerous. So in this case, you'll notice that the error message comes out. And it says, if you want to know more, you can run this. They have canonicalized errors, which means that you can get great documentation either in your editor or straight on the command line. And this, this goes on for a while, but this actually explains all of the different reasons why this might be a problem if you miss this case. So Rust is one of these rare exceptions where the developer experience allows you to gradually onboard and learn these experiences without having to work necessarily right next to someone or to just uh, painfully go through it. So now we've updated our code example, and we've added this underscore, which is a default case, and now it won't crash. Right? In this case, Rust is smart enough to know that the number of integers goes on forever, infinitely, in both directions. So you probably want to have a default case. You can never exhaustively list all of the cases. Uh, however, if you had an enum, for example, maybe you have an enum that's uh, a project state, is either open or closed, and you only cover the open, it would suggest rather than a default case, maybe you really should have a closed case. So we'll go through and actually help you write your program and tell you what you're missing as you go along. And again, because the compiler uh, is checking all this stuff, uh, the compiler is both going to be happy, and you, as a programmer, will be a little bit happier. And this comes to this point of correctness. And I think, fundamentally, debugging just sucks. There, is, there are very few cases um, outside of maybe a hobby project where you're tracking down like this elusive rabbit hole bug. Um, and you're, you're thinking, man, this is going to be a great story to tell other people at the pub. Uh, but outside of that, debugging generally sucks. And I would say there are three questions in order of easiest to hardest um, about debugging. The first is, who should be doing the debugging? Second is, when should it be done? And the third is, where? And I think who is really easy. Fundamentally, the language should be the one who is doing debu the debugging. A language should give you the expressive power to make bugs impossible to represent in the code. Right? If we can eliminate entire classes of errors just by nature of construction in the language, that's huge. Second is something like a compiler that is going to be able to read our code and understand what our intentions are. And it's going to tell us whenever we make these different mistakes, whenever we forget a case, whenever we get a type error between two different function calls, 
the compiler can do a lot of the debugging, at least noticing where the bugs are. And so now as a human, we can fix those bugs. Second is linters and tests. And the developer is kind of the last stage where debugging should happen. Because our time is worth a lot more, I think, than the compiler. And we're also a lot worse at noticing these errors than the compiler and the language. And ultimately, if a developer doesn't do the debugging, if you push it off until the very last minute, that means it's the user that does the debugging. I mean, this is a room of JavaScript developers, so there's a good chance that we've all been on some air, like airline booking site or a train booking site, and the form didn't submit. So you open up the JavaScript console, and you submit it via JavaScript, and it works. Right? That's not a great experience. Uh, the second question is, when should it be done? And this is a little bit more difficult. Because one thing that is really powerful with JavaScript is you can get something running very, very quickly. You can get something running very quickly. Right? It'll be on the web page. You can see it. You can click it. You can touch it. You can interact with it. But when the bugs happen, they happen much, much further away from where they occurred. Right? Whenever you actually put in the bug in the source code, when you experience it, it's much further down. Your context for resolving it is much, much less. And so very similar to Elm, Rust insists that debugging happen up front. The compiler is going to go through and check all of those cases. And if it can prove that there is a bug, it's going to require that you debug it now, while you have the most context. So this is a painful shift, I think, from more dynamic languages, like JavaScript or ClojureScript or these kinds of things. But it does make a big difference. Once you kind of accept that it's like banging your head against the wall, and you kind of come to enjoy it, then it's kind of nice. And it's not, it's not uncommon to have Rust programs that once you get through all of the errors, just work, even at a systems level. And I'll give a quick shout out about why uh, you might care as a JavaScripter about the community. But it is an incredibly warm and welcoming community. And they have a, a very unusual emphasis on empathy. Uh, systems level programmers, I think, often underestimate how difficult, how complex front end engineering is. Right? The possible state explosions that happen in UI programming are phenomenal. But it's often looked down on as not a real engineering discipline. And this is emphatically not the case in Rust. It's an incredibly warm and welcoming community. So <clears throat> as JavaScripters, why would we care? Let's talk about combining JavaScript and Rust, now that we're all sold on the experience of Rust. Uh, so I want to say there is a caveat here that using WebAssembly and, and therefore Rust uh, from JavaScript is initially going to feel foreign and unidiomatic and uncomfortable. Uh, we'll see what we can do to kind of recover some of that. Um, but just by default, let's go into it with this expectation. We're going to get some of those nice benefits from Rust, but we are going to have some trade-offs initially. So just as a high level, if we're doing JavaScript to Rust interop, we've written some code in Rust, and we want to use it from our JavaScript application. Initially, what this might look like is you know, your JavaScript loads up. It then goes out and fetches and loads some WebAssembly. WebAssembly is going to expose some functions over a bridge that JavaScript can call into. Uh, and then so JavaScript calls into it. And then the Rust does some magic. And eventually, it returns some data, maybe a string. And the problem here is that if you do this naive approach, then this involves a lot of allocations. By default, JavaScript has its memory. Whenever you send stuff over to uh, WebAssembly, there is this bridge, the, the set of exposed functions. And the runtime has to do translations between JavaScript's representation and WebAssembly's representation, what uh, Rust expects. And so there is a lot of overhead, potentially, by copying, by serializing, and deserializing. And if you remember, one of the main reasons we wanted to use Rust in the first place is that it opens up this potential for higher performance and correct concurrency. And so by incurring all this overhead, we're kind of shooting ourselves in the foot. So <clears throat> whenever we're doing interop, we kind of have this goal that as much as possible, we want to expose an interface from the Rust side that minimizes copying, serialization, and deserialization. <clears throat> 
And the way to typically do this is just kind of via pointers. So on the Rust, so what you would kind of see is opposed to that initial naive approach, JavaScript would load up some WebAssembly. Rust would expose a number of uh, functions. But one of those functions would typically be create the world or create an object. And Rust will store all of its objects, all of the, th the world that it knows about, and a little bit of memory that it controls. And then it returns a pointer or a handle back to JavaScript. And then it, JavaScript can then use that handle, a very, very small bit of data that it sends back and forth, as a way of manipulating that bit of data from afar. So you know, if you were to say, um, oh, let's uh, go into this. So, this, you know, fundamentally, this happens because, again, these are two separate worlds. On the JavaScript side, we have a lot of things that we're used to that are incredibly nice. Things like DOM access, uh, garbage collection. We are all familiar with objects and proxies and all the, the lovely things that come from there. Uh, JavaScript has a race and a string. How many kinds of strings does JavaScript have? Right? Like, that's not a question that makes sense. It doesn't really compute. Uh, whereas on the Rust side, right, Rust has some nice things. It has performance and manual memory management and whatnot. But it doesn't really have objects. Right? It has structs. They're maybe on the surface, very similar to JavaScript objects, but underneath the hood, quite different. Similarly, it doesn't just have arrays. It has arrays and vectors, because these have different performance characteristics, different mem uh, memory requirements. And so it gives you the ability to uh, choose what your representation is going to be. But that is a, an additional obligation. So you can kind of either think of it as you know, a power that Rust gives you or an obligation and responsibility that Rust gives you. And finally, uh, if you ask someone coming from JavaScript, uh, Rust has two kinds of strings. I know that uh, at, on their documentation, they say they only have one. But you, inside of their code, any code example, you'll see two kinds of strings. Uh, however. Rust has, a, or WebAssembly, has a very simple memory uh, model. It's effectively just one long array. Uh, raise your hand if you have used array buffers in JavaScript. OK. So for those of you who haven't, the idea is simply we're just going to allocate this big array. And there's just bytes in there. And we can choose to view them as unsigned 8-bit integers or 32-bit floats or whatnot. Um, but it's up to us. It's basically just a region of memory that we can bash on. And that's what WebAssembly operates off of. And so, and the nice thing is, this can actually be shared between both JavaScript and Rust. So Rust can very, very efficiently lay out, and this can be done automatically by the compiler, can lay out those data structures inside of this, web, or this uh, bit of shared memory. And then JavaScript can also peek and poke inside of that uh, if it needs to without going over the bridge. So this is how we're going to build an efficient uh, Rust library to be used from JavaScript. And you can see that this already feels kind of foreign, pretty unidiomatic. right? We're not passing objects back and forth. That is possible, but we incur those overheads, as we mentioned. Uh, this ends up being, uh, basically, the lingua franca is just bytes. Uh, what you want to do is just have Rust bash on that bit of shared memory. And JavaScript is going to read from it. So you can imagine, for example, if you're building a game, you would have JavaScript initialize a tick, maybe send the input over to the Rust side. The Rust very quickly computes what the next state of everything is. It runs all the physics. It updates all the positions, and then stores that inside of this shared memory. JavaScript then, whenever that's finished, go ahead and it takes that memory and then renders it to a canvas or inside of WebGL. And so that is a fairly unpleasant you know, uh, men mental model as a JavaScript person to think about. Right? We are now burdened with thinking about the byte representation of the Rust library. Rust has imposed its uh, view of the world on us as JavaScript developers. However, the, the Rust developer team is very aware of this and actually has gone to heroic lengths to make this really, really smooth. So let's say, for example, this is uh, just a small bit of code uh, from a game of life. So this is kind of on the Hello World uh, Rust WebAssembly um, example. And here I have an enum and as a cell. Uh, 
right? So a cell can either be dead or it can be alive. And I'm choosing to represent those enums as either 0 or 1. So I get to refer to them in the nice terms, like dead or alive, but Rust is going to take care of representing them in a very performant and space-efficient way. And you can see I have this function tick that is going to iterate, and it's going to check everything, and if a cell is alive, and X. And you know, there is a lot of code here, more than if it were just JavaScript. But it's not too bad. So we have you know, three or four different functions that we've written here in uh, Rust. And again, this is going to be operating on that shared memory that is foreign to JavaScript. And this is amazing. Whenever you build that package, Rust is actually going to generate for you an NPM package. It will also generate a TypeScript binding that works out of the box with things like VS Code that gives you an idiomatic interface. Right? Rust, so TypeScript doesn't care that the representation is 0 or 1. It's able to represent it in this really nice way. Right? So you get type checking all the way through from your JavaScript into your Rust code. And in fact, the TypeScript bindings that are generated, those are generated as though you were really a good TypeScript developer. Right? So like one of the big challenges with TypeScript is at any given time, when you do have to ship, and you're thinking, well, I'll come back and I'll type this later. This is, this is just an any right now. And that doesn't do a lot of good for your coworkers or for you later. But because Rust has deep insight into the types of its code, it can generate really, really well-formed TypeScript bindings. So you get nice autocomplete and nice idiomatic functions that you can use from JavaScript. This is a really, really impressive accomplishment. So I'm going to show a few basic examples of what this actually looks like inside of the Rust side of things. So there is a framework called U. This is one of the more extreme examples. Uh, but U is meant, it's inspired by React and Elm. And it's meant to be able to build entire front-end applications in Rust. And it wants to be able to, do th to take advantage of the correctness and the performance of Rust. So it does things automatically, like supporting concurrency. It does concurrency across web workers in a really impressive way. And you can notice here that, so for better or for worse, JavaScript has struggled with the idea of macros. Uh, you know, there were Suites JS a long time ago. There are now Babel transforms. Uh, but it hasn't really made it mainstream inside of JavaScript. Rust has macros. And that means that library authors can customize their libraries to really match the domain. So this is uh, valid Rust. This looks very, very similar to JSX, except that JSX can be provided as a library, not as some sort of secondary transform step or as a Babel plugin. And this is entirely type checked. Each bit of these, if you get a mistake in the, um, the property name here, it won't compile. If you pass the wrong type in there, it won't compile. You get strong guarantees while also not paying a huge overhead in terms of syntax. It's, right, this is not terribly verbose. Uh, there are some scary uh, you know, ampersands and greater than symbols and hashtags and whatnot. Uh, we'll go over that a little bit later. But overall, like, you can kind of squint your eyes, and this looks readable. Similarly, with web workers, I think this is a thing that is doable initially. It seems very doable in JavaScript. But it becomes very, very challenging to guarantee correctness between, and performance between web workers. So in this U um, framework, you define an actor, and you say, I have a request. Whenever someone's talking to me, they can send me a request. So they can ask me a question, for example, and that question will have a string. And I will respond to them with an answer, which is a string. Uh, and now whenever, now I have to write a function that handles incoming messages. And you can see that I'm going to switch over that message. And if it's a question, I'm going to extract the body. And then I'm going to respond with an answer. And that's cool. And the impressive thing here is if I go ahead and add, maybe you know, I want to change my program a little bit. I want to change my web workers. So instead of just a question, they can also send me a demand. That's possible. If I add that here, this will fail to compile because I don't handle that case. So Rust is, has my back. It's going to watch out for me. It's going to make sure that I don't forget a case. And then the underlying framework is going to take care of spawning web workers and communicating with them just like threads 
but keeping that guarantee of correctness and security. Finally, a bit of canvas drawing. So again, <clears throat> uh, Rust has its memory, JavaScript has its memory, but they can uh, share memory via this shared array buffer. So this is on the JavaScript side. I'm going to import the memory from my you know, uh, WASM uh, application. And in JavaScript, I'm going to go ahead and do all my drawing. Right? Rust has done all the heavy lifting. It's done the computing on the back end, you know, the back end uh, inside of the browser. Um, I'm going to extract the memory that we share. And now I'm going to iterate over it. So I'm going to you know, uh, manifest this as 8-bit uh, integers. And I can just say, hey, if this index is dead, then it's dead uh, or else alive. And I just draw. I feel a rectangle inside of my canvas. So I'm doing as little. You can notice there's nearly no allocations within here. This is very, very performant JavaScript. And it also doesn't feel too burdensome. It's not syntactically heavy. It's not too difficult to read. And yet, we're able to benefit from all of that thought and uh, correctness that has gone into the Rust side of things. And so I mentioned beforehand that there are a lot more symbols. Uh, Rust is more symbol heavy uh, than JavaScript, at least for the time being. You know, give the standards body more time. I'm sure JavaScript will get more symbols. Uh, but if you, in this case, like one of the, the really cool things, uh, especially for me, whenever I first started out with Rust, is that uh, I didn't understand these symbols. You know, I'll read a tutorial, and I think, oh, I, I kind of get it, maybe. Um, but what happens is, if you omit it, if you do it wrong, that has some semantic meaning. And Rust cares about correctness. And so if your semantics are incorrect, it's going to tell you. And then that combined with the Rust team's focus on developer experience and good errors means that oftentimes, it will navigate you out of that problem. So in this case, you can see that I have this ampersand and a mute symbol, which means that I want to get this, borrow this as a mutable thing. I want to have right access to this right now. This is not an immutable reference to this thing. Uh, and it says here that like, you're using mute B to make it mutable, but you're also trying to borrow it, and you can't really do that. So maybe you should just try removing the and mute part. And we'll actually guide you out. And so what happens is, as you start to remove these things and you see the errors go, like, pop up and go away, you start to get a sense of what these things actually mean. And again, it helps you kind of climb that hill from being you know, someone who is new to having some proficiency in this language without all of that painful intermediate step. Oftentimes, like, the biggest problem whenever you're approaching a new language is there's something very, very simple, but you don't know how to fix it. And you spend two days banging your head against the wall trying to figure it out. And if you just had someone who could tell you, hey, this is why this happens. Don't do this. Do this instead. It would be five minutes, and you could move on. So the Rust team has done a good job of pushing that uh, set of experiences down into the compiler itself. So I want to end with uh, one big demo. Uh, this is not written by me, but this is like one of my favorite examples here. So while we've been talking, this is a Game Boy emulator written in Rust and then drawn on the front end with JavaScript. Uh, this has been running the entire time. And if I go ahead and record some performance of this, and uh, I'll start playing this. And I don't know what language this, this is. This is uh, Zelda. Uh, so I'll go ahead and stop this. And the cool thing is, if we zoom into the stack traces here, or into the performance profile, this is how much time, you know, granted, Game Boys are not the most advanced systems, and maybe it shouldn't be taking so much time. But inside of, uh, with Rust, we can implement very, very kind of idiomatically. We can understand the performance or in the structure of the underlying hardware, build out an emulator that is very performant, and then expose a nice interface into JavaScript. So that if you look at this, like the performance timings here, there's tiny, right? It's taking up so little of our, uh, of our CPU. And this is a fantastic experience, both for the developers, but also for us as end users. We can push a lot of that complexity down into Rust, but still expose a nice interface for us to use as JavaScript. And of course, the obvious thing that you would want to do with that next is uh, obviously what the author did here, which is to hook this up to WebVR. And so you can play your, uh, 
your Game Boy emulator on the web through Rust and WebVR. Uh, all right, and this is one quick crazy idea that uh, I can't vouch for, but I came across uh, while I was researching this, and it seems pretty crazy. There, someone has written, so Cries is a um, big Rust emulator writer and kind of a uh, speed gamer. And he has written a WebAssembly to Rust compiler. And there is a subset of TypeScript called AssemblyScript. And AssemblyScript is a non-garbage collected subset of TypeScript. So what he did was take that subset, compile it down to WebAssembly. So there was a ga Game Boy emulator written in TypeScript, or in AssemblyScript, pardon me. He took that, compiled it down to WebAssembly, then compiled that WebAssembly over to Rust, and then added some SDL on top of it, and had a native running Game Boy emulator on his system uh, without having to rewrite it. Which I think, you know, I don't, I don't totally know where that's going to go, but that is something mind-blowing, right? Being able to compile these higher-level languages down into WebAssembly, which then becomes kind of a universal format that can even go to native, it's crazy. So I want to end on this idea that I think we are actually at an unprecedented opportunity in our industry, that generally speaking, our industry only moves forward via secretion. It's in some ways incredibly depressing. Um, in some ways amazing, but mostly depressing. Uh, a big part of the reason that we have so many security vulnerabilities and whatnot is because we continue to lay additional layer to fix the problems of the previous layer. And we lay another layer and another layer. Right? Security is hard. Maybe C groups. Maybe we add in C groups to Linux. But that's kind of uncomfortable to use, so maybe we do Docker. And then uh, like, suddenly this whole set of companies and whatnot are built on top of this set of abstractions. And those abstractions also contain all of the previous abstractions. For me, we have terminals. This is the craziest idea, I feel. I have a terminal inside of my computer. It's called a terminal, like an endpoint. But I don't use it to actually speak to any mainframes, as far as I know. I generally use it to work on my computer. It's an embedded thing. But the terminal is such a layered tool at this point. It still understands ancient escape codes. It's still compatible with these old ways. And in some ways, that is impressive. In some ways, that's incredibly restrictive. It makes it very difficult to have a good experience from a program written for a terminal because it has assumptions built into mainframes communicating to teletypes. And this is one of the first times where we have a chance for a clean slate implementation. Right? So I worked on unikernels before, which is about kind of removing um, operating systems and just running your application directly on a hypervisor. And that's pretty cool. The problem is that while that has fewer uh, resources that are necessary and security concerns, you know, every year, computers just get faster. Raspberry Pi will be twice as fast in a year or two. And so maybe it doesn't matter. Linux just works, right? Hardware will catch up to Linux. Uh, however, this is the first time where we have a platform where there isn't an inherent advantage to shipping all of libc. There's a chance here with Rust and WebAssembly to create a new standard library that is safe, secure, and sensible for all of us. And then being able to take that and possibly remove all of the previous abstractions and start with a clean slate that is actually secure going forward. And the prediction I have here is that within, I think, the next five to 10 years, most of the JavaScript that we use will be written in Rust. I don't think most people will write Rust, but I don't think they'll know. Like, they'll use Rust, but from JavaScript, and it won't matter to them. Because again, what do you get from Rust? You get really fine grain, grain control over performance, security, and importantly, correctness. And this is really big for library authors. Right? React powers millions of apps at this point. And so they really care. Any, any tweak of performance they can get out, any tweak they can get for better correctness for their users affects so many lives. It's fantastic. And so library authors are going to be under huge pressure to eke out ever-increasing performance and security and safety benefits. So 
Closing pitch. Again, I think that rust is like banging your head against the wall. But at a very slight angle. So every time you hit it, you actually make a little bit of progress. And by the end, you look back, and you've written programs that you couldn't believe that you wrote. All right, so here are some resources, and that's it. Thank you very much.